Welcome to Mind Rolling, our new podcast, and I'm Raghu Marcus. Accompanied by David Silver, me. And today we have a, a very, very dear friend who's joining us. His name is Danny Goldberg. And David, I'm going to leave the introductions to you. Senior to me, you are, as an older friend. Just about. Well, hi, Danny. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I've known Danny for 112 years, but actually since 1970, I think. And um, we're not going to go into all the details because it's just too massive to do in the time allotted. But Danny is, um, was and is very much so still uh, a huge figure in the music industry. And the reason we're talking to him is because we love him, but also because uh, he is a... I hate to use this expression, but he is a spiritual gentleman. And the fact that he's been able to combine a music uh, professional life, very, very good one, with that is in itself remarkable. Um, Danny was chairman of Warner Brothers Records, president of Atlantic, head of Mercury at Polygram. He was a manager of Nirvana and Kurt Cobain. He uh, ran Swansong, which was Led Zeppelin's record company. And this is just a fraction. I know that sounds very hyperbolic, but that's a fraction of what Danny's done in his life. And um, a great friend and a great writer. He's done a couple of really special books. One was uh, Dispatches from the Culture Wars. The other one was Bumping into Geniuses. And I might mention, because we're sponsored by Audible.com, that if you go to Audible, you can hear a thing called Memoir, The Kaboom Generation, from the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books 2009, which Danny did with Mike Farrell, narrated by the great Sarah Davison. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're real thrilled to have Danny here because this show is about culture and consciousness. And so, uh, welcome, Danny. I'm so glad you're here, at least on the phone. You're in New York, we're in Nashville. And uh, we'd like to start by asking a very simple question, really, which is, forgetting all the professional stuff for a moment, we'll get into that. If you had to pinpoint a moment in your life or a, a time when you were kind of, so to speak, woken up and started to explore and be fascinated by consciousness and, if you like, spirituality, how would you describe that? When was it? What was it? Well, um, there, there are a few moments at different points in my life. Uh, certainly, um, uh, uh, as, a, as a child, um, I remember my mother reading to me the, a children's version of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, uh, you know, I was not that impressed with Bible stories because they seemed to be part of some sort of organized cultural brainwashing that you were supposed to just understand. But because the um, story of the Greek gods and goddesses didn't have any of that expectation or baggage, I was quite taken with the notion of the goddess Athena uh, looking out for and helping Odysseus, even when he had misfortunes he had brought on himself. Um, so that was in the back of my mind, and I realized it in the last few years when I reread it, and I still just love that story so much, and I love the idea of a goddess looking out for me, and I believe one is. Um, then, uh, certainly, I'm a 60s kid who was influenced by psychedelics, and, the, and taking LSD put me in a frame of mind of thinking that there were dimensions other than what my senses could feel, and the time was flexible, and, and that was in the back of my mind, but I, I, I stopped taking drugs, you know, you know, when I was 18, because I'd gotten into trouble and so on, but that was always in the back of my mind. And certainly uh, hearing Ram Dass on uh, WBAI, this is before Be Here Now came out, but he was giving lectures with content that would eventually met, find its way into Be Here Now was a revelation because of the way he was able to connect uh, ancient uh, traditions, particularly Hindu traditions uh, and spirituality with an LSD awareness and you know he had a hypnosis factor and a legitimacy that didn't feel preachy and and definitely uh, was a huge turning point for me in terms of embracing the idea of being open-minded and positive about uh, about spirituality and then 
And then, like a lot of people, a, a, a huge turning point for me was at a low point when I was unemployed and desperate and unhappy and couldn't figure out what I was going to do with my life at around 22. And, and, I, and, and I, I, I had been able to meet Ram Dass, and he had suggested I go to the meetings of a teacher named Hilda Charlton. And uh, going to her meeting and getting, you know, which I'm happy to talk about more, but that was absolutely the central turning point, and she certainly was my spiritual teacher. She never let anyone call her a guru, but I believe she was my guru. And with her sort of blessings and teachings and, you know, created a context for me to live the rest of my life up through this minute, you know, which certainly mired in the material world and uh, nonetheless uh, always, uh, I feel, a connection to some uh, bigger. I'm a great fan of a quote of Martin Luther King in which he said, uh, although we live in the colony of time, we owe our allegiance to the empire of eternity. And she was the one, I think, that really made me feel that empire of eternity was actually real and not just a story in books. Yeah. So, Danny, we, um, David and I, when we first started, uh, you know, this is all a brand new podcast, and when we first did the first few podcasts, we we began with our introduction to the things that uh, that uh, transformed our minds and uh, our spirits, and certainly, of course, for all of us in those days, psychedelics, uh, as you said, was uh, an integral part, and we we explained that out as well. And then David and I had two uh, ex- musical experiences that were incredibly important uh, to that transformation, and. Uh, I, I, we just did a, a, a podcast actually about music as a transformational ally, and certainly uh, an al- the two allies that we were discussing at that time. Uh, one was Dylan because he was expressing, uh, you know, the angst and the uh, the oppressiveness of the culture at the time, but he was also connecting on another on, on a deeper uh, level, intuitive level. And then something beyond any words at all, and it so happened, you know, David and I were both fortunate to have actually uh, uh, seen John Coltrane live. And, and I, that was my first uh, completely uh, transformative musical experience where I actually went into some kind of, you know, I look back on meditative state, uh, you know, through that music uh, so what can you talk about some of your initial musical uh, experiences or experiences with various artists? Sure, artists? of course it's been such a huge part of my life and it ended up becoming my working with musicians became my vocation I think because of uh, you know how much music meant to me um, again it's segmented I, I, I had a period where uh, when I was younger where I really loved certain classical pieces I'm a dilettante when it comes to classical music, but there are certain pieces that affected me when I was 13, 14, 15 that still can put me in a happy state, and that includes some the Chopin's third ballad for some reason, and uh, and the, a couple of the Beethoven violin sonatas and, and a Schubert cello sonata. And so there's a certain group of classical pieces that at a very lonely time in my life uh, spoke to me. I, I, I later, uh, you know, I also had a, a connection with folk music at a relatively tender age, and some of it stayed with me, particularly uh, Phil Oaks, um, although he's not really considered a spiritual songwriter. He was a topical political songwriter. There was something about the attitude, the, t- the t- sound of his voice, and the way he used words that, t- to me, just, you know, c- conveyed a, a bigger picture and, and a, and a kind of heroic idea about what it was to be alive and to address the world as, you know, not necessarily, you know, as a, you know, with a, with a rebellious but loving idea that, that still speaks to me when I, when I hear his voice. But certainly I am with you as far as Dylan goes. There's something about his use of words, the poetry, the attitude that, that uh, expanded the idea of what it was to be a person and, uh, and, and, and it gives one something to aspire to because the, the brilliance of being able to think of some of those words, you, you, you know, still dazzles me to this day. Um, uh, you know, there's so many uh, artists over the years that, that, that have spoken to me, but a lot of the ones that mean the most to me are the ones from when I was that age. There's something about being 16, 17, 18, 19 that makes, I think, you particularly impressionable to music. So some of the Beatles music still speaks to me a lot. Uh, some of the... Um, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, um, 
not a particularly original list. A lot of people were moved by these same pieces of music, but uh, I still uh, I still get touched by some of them when I hear them and go back to them. Uh, slightly more obscure would be Richard and Mimi Farina, who I, I go back to their mm-hmm. records a lot, and I'm just really impressed with the um, uh, you know, there's the depth of, uh, of of kind of the feeling that it evoked, and and it's definitely a bridge to a to a to a wider view of what life is and what it is that you know. Uh, still, so I'm sure there's dozens of others I'm not thinking of right now, but those are the ones that come to mind. Uh, great poetic singer-songwriter named Paul Siebel, I go back to a lot. Um, but you know Van Morrison's early records, uh, mm, right. um, and uh, you know I, I could just we could spend the whole time just talking about records. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that David and I have been talking about is. There seemed to be a, a – we're talking about a relevance that happened in the late 60s and early 70s musically that – is that relevance still here today? I mean you've been – you know, I know Danny's man, – just so people know, Danny's managing some pretty great acts uh, these days and uh, and so – no, you're you're right in it still. Is is that relevant? I mean, Steve. You no, know, I don't think my role as a manager is what gives me credibility about its relevance. I think <laughs> it's my role as father of an 18 year old and a 22 year old because <laughs> the only people that are qualified to answer that question are young people. And I, I I think Kanye West means as much to my son Max as Bob Dylan meant to me. Really, that I can absolutely tell you. And that's why I believe it's the case. And I just think that there's something about getting older that removes you somewhat from a Connectedness. I still like music a lot. I, I it's been slightly ruined for me by by working in it. So I associate it so much with my vocation. The price I paid for the intimacy and the relationship with artists is that I don't hear music with, with as pure mm. uh, ears as I would if I weren't working with people. I'm, I romanticize the people I represent. I love Steve Earle, who I manage. I think he's a great singer songwriter and poet and you know, yeah. at, at, a, at a very high level and a lot of other people. But, but you know, my own relationship with music has been tremendously complicated by decades of it being how I made my living, where I gained my, uh, uh, half the time, my self-esteem and status in the world from. And that, that does kind of screw up the pure enjoyment of music, right. and that's why when I really want to just listen to music, I'll listen to older music usually, because it doesn't have any of the baggage that the newer stuff does. But as a parent, I've seen how music is uh, so meaningful to my kids, and 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 it absolutely convinces me that that the notion that there was something unique about my uh, teenage years and that other teenagers and subsequent generations uh, didn't have is delusional, and that every every generation finds music, and it, it it's definitely a bridge to an identity and a way of defining oneself mm-hmm. today, just as much as it was in, in times past. And and I think to my parents' generation, I think the big bands and jazz. I mean, there's this incredible interview with Jerry Wexler, who uh, died at the age of 92 about four or five years ago, and who was the president of Atlantic and who produced the great Aretha Franklin albums, among others, and the first Ray Charles, you know, the great Ray Charles albums. And he was talking about when he was in his, uh, a young man in his 20s being a jazz collector, and how the great jazz to him was the stuff from 10 years earlier, and how you knew someone was really had depth as if they appreciated certain musicians from the 20s as distinguished from those in the 30s and 40s. So, I mean, I think this is a universal thing about the youth and music that we have to honor as we get older. I think we'd be remiss, uh, you know, we'll see if uh, if uh, you agree or not uh, to, uh, to give us some of your experience. One of the... Um, greatest uh, impacts on 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 the culture of course was nirvana um and j- just uh, i mean at the, the, you were pretty that was pretty young in your career at that point right dealing with them and and uh, meeting kurt and so on can you can you just give us a little bit of a an ex- the experience of that and uh and i think you, i remember you telling me at one point you had no idea it was just a gut feeling that you had. Can you talk about him a little bit? Well, uh, you know, um, I was, I was, uh, um, I've been around for a while. Um, you know, uh, I met, uh, you, you know, Nirvana, I, I was, I was, you know, my late thirties, early forties. So I, I'd been around for a while. Uh, and, um, I was the old school guy. I was older than him, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I was in my early forties. He was in his mid twenties and that's a big, big age difference. Um, 
you know, I um, I was pretty jaded by that time. I'd been in the business since I was 18 and, and was definitely very into how to make money and, uh, you know, be a winner instead of a loser and have hits instead of flops and, you know, uh, certainly uh, had many layers of, uh, of cynicism and, and jadedness that with which I addressed things, although I still, uh, you know, I still wanted to love what I was doing. Um, uh, and uh, I, I took them on because uh, Sonic Youth told me they were good. And Sonic Youth was really cool at the time, and they were a client of mine. And, uh, you know, I, I did it the way I did a lot of things. I, I had an office of 20-some people and didn't really know what I was getting into. I just met them, and they were supposed to be cool, and people wanted them, and I gave them a good rap, and I liked my politics. And, and then I realized I probably should see them. And uh, they were opening to Dinosaur Jr. at a place called The Palace in L.A. This before Nevermind came out, but they'd already written and recorded about half of Nevermind. They were kind of in the middle of it. And, um, you know, I went by myself. My wife, Rosemary, was pregnant at the time with our first kid, and, and uh, you know, we, we, yeah, I just I stood there in the back, and I was transfixed with his intimacy with the audience. I, I saw some weird, ineffable ability that he had to connect with people in the back, even when they didn't know the songs. He wasn't flamboyant or anything like that, but there was this, uh, you know, sensitivity mm-hmm. and empathy that people would later write about that was really palpable, and I, I, I was really uh, high from it. And I remember driving home, and, you know, this was the early days of car phones, and before they told you not to talk on the car phone, you know, when you were driving and calling Rosemary and saying, you will not believe I great. She was so surprised to hear me excited about music because I was always talking about the business and not about music. So I, I knew at that moment that that he was really something special. And then, uh, you know, and then when the record was done, it was it was so great. I mean, again, I didn't pretend even then I was pretty old and wasn't a super musicologist or critic or anything like that. But those songs were so incredible. His voice was so great. And, you know, I, I knew this was like, something really special. I didn't quite know how special, but I, uh, you, you know, I, I just felt a tremendous uh, buzz. And now at the beginning, I didn't know him that well. Um, I was connecting more with Chris Novoselic, who was kind of a political dude, and I had a partner, John Silva, who was dealing with him day to day. But the relationship flipped at a certain point because he, um, when he got involved with Courtney Love, my wife, Rosemary, had been Courtney's longtime lawyer, and Courtney kind of felt safe with me, and, and, and the other guys and people in my office really didn't like her. And so I suddenly became the Kurt guy instead of the, you know, instead of sort of the mm-hmm. senior boss guy that was administering somebody else who was hands-on. I, was, I became the sort of hands-on person who dealt with Kurt for, you know, really the rest of his life. And uh, it was, uh, he was just a beautiful, beautiful person, really? uh, you know, haunted by demons and self-destructiveness mm-hmm. and a junkie and killed himself. But very nice to other people and just just extraordinarily brilliant when it came to the all the different aspects of being an artist uh, and a rock artist uh, he wrote the songs he played guitar he was the lead singer he pro- he really produced the records he didn't take producer credit but he completely controlled the creation of the records he wrote the uh, the uh, scene by scene every every uh, video uh, every every detail of it and supervised every last edit of it. He designed the T-shirts. Um, he he uh, was incredibly conscious about every aspect of what he was doing, what he was wearing, every photo he took, uh, every you know he he he. There were a lot of things about being a rock star that he didn't like and complained about, and the machinery and the pressure that came with it grossed him out a little bit, and he sometimes kind of hated himself for playing the game. But wow, could he play the game? Mm-hmm. He want, he was just a genius at a category of rock artist that I've been fascinated with my whole life, and it was it was the one time when I really worked with somebody at that iconic, legendary level that you know from during the time when he was making his greatest impact, and it was just uh, so so sad that he uh, couldn't uh, couldn't deal with you know his self hatred and decide to kill himself. I'll never get over it. No, it's impossible to to dismiss that because he was so young and so influential. I would say, Danny, having known you for so long, that um, you have been involved with many artists who influenced so many people's consciousness. Whether we call them spiritual or not is is irrelevant. I mean, I think that Led Zeppelin, for instance, uh, as, as, you know, as indulgent as they were and as crazy as they were and as over the top as they were, the effect that they had, at least when they for most of their career, 
upon audiences, and you took me to many Zeppelin concerts, so I remember it distinctly, uh, was close to spiritual. Uh, people just out of their bodies, out of their minds, relieved of their daily nonsense, and just happy as clams at those Zeppelin concerts when they were at their very best. So wouldn't you agree that someone doesn't have to be, you know, quote, spiritual to have a deep resonant effect upon their audiences and their fans? And I, I, I would ask you whether you believe that Plant and Page uh, were of that order, were of that, of, that, of, that, of that level. I mean, I believe rock music's an art form, and they're, they're one of the great rock bands ever, you know, so art has a particular place in the spiritual pantheon, and it's it's a positive one for the most part, um, and they're really a good band, you know, I I, I think, um, you know, uh, I don't think it's got the same transcendent quality as, you know, Krishnadas or Mozart, you know, but I, I, I think they're an incredibly important rock band to their fans, and I meet people all the time who just want me to talk about them and mm. feel happy that they met somebody who was around Zeppelin, and their music uh, continues to, uh, you know, reach uh, not only younger, you know, I think mean a lot to the people that were young when, when they happened as their favorite band. I know a guy who's in his, you know, 40s, and he always talked about Zeppelin, and then there's younger people still discover it. I mean, I think they're a great rock band. I, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know... Um, in the hierarchy of spirituality, I mean, I don't think it's the same as, uh, you know, uh, Sai Baba or, uh, you know, the Gregorian chants or, you know, truly conscious spiritual music, but it has a sense of joy and um, uh, affirmation of life uh, that is uh, that is not to be uh, trifled with, you know, and it makes people happy. And, you know, I think, I think entertainment is a perfectly valid, positive thing in life you know it's like you know so but but you know it's it's um i don't i don't know quite quite where to place it um but but you know i remember getting you david tickets to the zeppelin and massive square garden and i was you were not that impressed with them you know i thought yeah, i was like so i like i say i was romanticized anyway i work with them. i think like, weren't they great and you said yeah they were okay yeah that night i was just cranky i remember uh, you know and jimmy page occasionally would do guitar solos that would drive you mad because they were i think that was one of those nights when they were sort of out of control just a, he's a great great guitar player i mean uh, they're a great band i'm so and it meant so much to my career and my life that i got to work with him but he's not my favorite guitar player i mean if the great guitar players i'm a, i saw peter green play one night with when he was with Fleetwood Mac. Oh, just, really? I'll never forget. There was something transcendent. Again, I don't know anything about him. I never met him. But, but, but you know, I think there are people that can be tormented, but they can still be a vessel of very high energy. Mm. It doesn't mean that they themselves are, you know, happy, fulfilled, or right. gurus of any kind. Right. And, 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 you know, I think that that's a phenomenon. You meet with artists who are, you know, wounded, but they still can be a vessel of this brilliance. And yeah, I think that's from by all accounts, Jack Kerouac was such a person, you know. Yeah. And 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 uh, you know, in terms of my favorite guitarist, like I think Peter Green is right up there as as a, as a forgotten master. And obviously, Hendrix is just still mind-blowingly great to hear him over the years. Um, and uh, Jeff Beck on a good night, uh, you know, was right up there. So I mean, I think Jimmy Page is a great writer, conceived of the band, understood where rock history was and they came right after cream and they, they were the Kings and they were the heavyweight champs for those five or six years. But artistically, um, you know, uh, you know, there are other guitar players that, uh, you know, uh, I, I really love a lot too. There's something about guitar heroes at their best. And I manage a guy, Tom Morello, who on a good night is as good as anybody that yeah, ever there lived. You I go. know it's self-serving to say yeah. it, but no, you know, no, absolutely to, not. There's yeah. a, the, you know, the, the, the ghost of Tom Jode of, with him and Bruce Springsteen doing that and the guitarist solos yeah. he plays in that. That's, that's up there yeah. with anything. Oh, oh no, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, you know, just to speak about, Tom Morello for a moment. I mean, yes, he's a great guitar player and an entertainer, but he's also a changer of consciousness. I mean, he's a, a, a very big figure, as we know now, in the Occupy movement and led the recent anniversary. And um, you've been involved with many artists. I think that, that, you know, Bonnie Raitt is another one that did many good causes. It may not be, quote, spiritual, but it's certainly humanitarian. And that's, you know, well, Louis Armstrong was a humanitarian also. Oh, God, I love Louis Armstrong so much. When you talk about music, there was a movie called The Five Pennies 
that I saw when I was about 10 that had Louis Armstrong and Danny Kane. And I think that was the first musician I fell in love with was Louis Armstrong, the way he played mm. the trumpet. I mean, what a talk about a sound that could just make the world better when you hear it. Or his singing of What a Wonderful World, remember? Yeah, oh, yeah, God. yeah. Yeah, that's it. I want to switch gears a little bit here, uh, just broadening uh, this discussion. Um because we've been talking about music a, a lot uh, in, in these podcasts and, and, again, how much it affected us and how much it affected those around us and uh, led us to, an o- to openings that uh, we previously didn't have. But, you know, that quote that you gave of, uh, of, of Martin Luther King's, I think that's, uh, you know, we, you and I talked about it uh, when we talked about doing this podcast a couple of weeks ago. Um, can you repeat that quote? And I'd like to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, he said, and it was in the middle of a sermon or a speech, and I, 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 there was a period where I became kind of obsessed with Martin Luther King's speeches, and you could order from somewhere in Atlanta cassettes. This was still in the cassette era, and I just listened to all of them, and certain of them stuck with me. And in one of them, he said, although we live in the colony of time, we owe our allegiance to the empire of eternity. And it's just, there's so much depth to that. I mean, it's interesting to think of empire as a positive thing, because, you know, in in the corporal plane, you know, empires are usually kind of materialistic, militaristic, and gross. And then, obviously, in the Star Wars trilogy, the evil empire is, is the main player. But he was not talking about that kind of an empire. He was talking about the hierarchy of reality. And, and although we spend most of our time living in, you know, by calendar, years, days, minutes, hours, measuring things, how many pounds you weigh, how much money you have, all different other kinds of things. The colony of time, you know, that there is another reality, and, and to remember that that's, to have allegiance to that and to aspire to remember that, which is the best I can do. I, I Most of my time, I forget it. The fun thing about communing with you in a podcast like this is it's an opportunity to try to remember it. Um, so that's the quote, and it's been one I've been really kind of obsessed with for the last couple of months and trying to trying to uh, figure out how it applies to my life. Well, those, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about, I mean, we um, actually, of course, you and David uh, met each other uh, right around that time of uh, all of this discovery, in late 60s and then early 70s and meeting Ramdas. I had, of course, met him at the same time, and then... Um, we actually met up uh, at Hilda's. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about, because that's what was happening to us. We heard the word. We heard a word. We heard it from a few different people. Ramdas was uh, obviously extraordinarily important to the three of us because it, it opened up uh, our minds and, uh, and, and, and propelled us into this internal investigation, into into that empire that you quoted. Um, and uh, just talk a little bit about your personal experience at that at that point and what that meant to you. Well, I mean, firstly, you know, I was not raised by religious parents, so religion was sort of this part of the established order. I wasn't anti-religious, uh, uh, but I, 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 I didn't feel any connection with it spiritually. It was just, to me, part of history. Uh, had rules to it. There were nice people involved with it, but I, I never was by misfit. I never, uh, you know, my family was not a member of a shul. I associated Christianity with kind of uh, the establishment. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I... Um, I, uh, I, 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 I just, uh, I didn't know what to do with it in, in turn. It didn't seem to apply in my life. I was uh, fascinated by Eastern religion in a very superficial way because of, uh, honestly, because of the Beatles and other rock artists that talked about it, and it, it, it didn't have the cultural baggage. It wasn't associated with the rules about sex or, you know, support of the Vietnam War or, you know, uh, you know, Salem witch trials or anything like that. But, but I didn't feel comfortable with it in a personal way because it always seemed a little culty to me and I didn't want to join anything where people would boss me around or tell me what to do or what to do with my hair or anything Mm -hmm. like that. And um, it took a particular context to allow me to own the idea personally 
of experimenting with consciousness. And, and Ram Dass was absolutely a huge breakthrough in terms of that. I, I was ripe for it because I, I, I was intrigued and people I respected were into it. But, but you know, uh, my own, um, my own uh, thing had a lot to do with um, praying and with really taking kind of a personal decision to, to try to talk to God. I never was a good meditator. I'm kind of ADD, have a very hard time concentrating. Uh, I can occasionally, even to this day, I can occasionally meditate, but I don't do it in a disciplined fashion every day. I never got into that habit. Uh, it can be very meaningful at times, but not an everyday thing. But prayer is much easier. And the first time I went to Hilda's meetings, Hilda Charlton was a woman who had uh, lived in India for around 20 years. She went there to be a dancer, and she had studied with Yogananda uh, when, and knew him. In, and and I, I was a great uh, fan of the book, Autobiography of a Yogi. It's still one of my favorite books, you know, as a doorway to understanding Hinduism and feeling that it was real to some people. And she said, kids, you know, she always talked to all the students, kids. She said, you can't, uh, you, you don't, You've got to talk to God and confront God and challenge God. You've got to say, I don't care what you did in the Bible supposedly a thousand years ago. You've got to, uh, you've got to show me that you exist now and challenge him to answer a prayer in 24 hours. <laughs> and that was such a outlandish thing to say because that's like mm -hmm. 24 hours, a pretty short time. And at this time, I'd been unemployed for many, many months and was pretty desperate. I was 22. I had no college education. My entire identity was wrapped up in the notion that I fit into the music business, and I wasn't fitting in. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have any hobbies. I didn't have any talents. I had a few friends, one of whom is David Silver, who was on the phone here, and, and the next day David called me, uh, who had known of my uh, hapless plight for a job for some time, and told me that uh, his boss uh, had read something I wrote and wanted me to work on some project for three weeks in uh, having to do with experimental video, a subject I knew absolutely nothing about. And uh, I got $200 a week for three weeks. It was like a godsend. But then the project was over. And then I went to another one of these Hilda meetings. I just dragged myself there and walked out and said, uh, God, I, I meant a full-time job. And I swear to God, the next day I got a call from this PR company that I'd applied to months earlier and, and got the job that eventually took me to Led Zeppelin. And since then, I've worked pretty constantly for the last 35 or 40 years. So I had an extremely direct experience in a very material way uh, that, 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 that made me really pay attention to everything else Hilda was saying. Mm. And everything else she was saying involved love. And that was her thing, was love, love, love. And, and you know, it opened my heart to feel this ineffable energy that, uh, that occasionally I still can feel, and that even when I don't feel it, I can remember that it exists and try to find my way there. So, I, I mean, I was just blessed with a very tangible uh, pathway that was, like, undeniable to me. And I've struggled to stay on it ever since, and it's a constant a challenge because I have so many other uh, uh, earthly interests, <laughs> and I can easily get caught up in the colony of time. But, but you know, she was an incredible force to me. She wasn't somebody who wanted to become famous, and she did not become famous. But to hundreds of people that were her students, there's a website that we're on, and we remember her. She passed away 20-some years ago. Or I guess 25 years ago now, but uh, but she's uh, was a channel to me into the idea of devotion, the idea of the divine mother. I still I kind of define myself if I had to pick a path, it's devotee of the divine mother, and I just try to pray because it's a lot easier to do than meditating. And you know uh, I can at least for if I can't do it for 10 minutes, I can do it for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find usually some good happens, you know, for well, me. And I wouldn't expect anyone to do anything on faith, but my experience has been that it puts me in another place. And once I'm in another place, I can I can try to remember a wider concept of being human. And other times I don't remember it, and I you know become kind of like a schmuck. But you know, <laughs> well, it's something all, keeps pulling me back. It's that struggle you talked about. It's the struggle. The struggle over these many years since then that we all are putting one foot in front of the other each day. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, when you think about these things, these miraculous pieces of karma, if I hadn't known you, there's absolutely no chance that I would have gone to Hilda Charlton's meeting ever. 
because when I was that age, um, yes, I heard about May Herbaba only because I loved The Who and Peter Townsend loved May Herbaba. And I'd interviewed the Maharishi for my TV show, so I knew about TM. But I would never have gone to Hilda's if you hadn't dragged me there, which you did. Because I remember very vividly you saying to me, you've got to come to this meeting. And I said, what kind of meeting? And you told me, and I looked at you as if you were nuts. And I said, well, I can't. What did they do? I mean, it sounds like a Sunday school to me. I was extremely, you know, superior about it. And in my intellectual self, thought that it was something I couldn't do. But you insisted, and as I trusted you, I went. And I can honestly say without the slightest hyperbole that if that hadn't happened, I don't know whether I would have gone on any kind of path except a tremendously self-destructive one. So that, to me, is a miracle. That well, there's this, you know, she used to say, you know, you take one step towards God, God takes ten steps towards you, and that's certainly been my experience. Again, I am not particularly disciplined. I have not, uh, there are people that have practiced sadhana and have been devotees, and oh, God, I just bow to them. You know, it's not been my way. I've been preoccupied with the world and, and, and have a hard time concentrating, but I found that very small gestures toward the divine result in, 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 a, in a real positive response and you can kind of then get into some sort of a virtuous cycle with it, at least for periods of time, and build, build over time. And of course, getting older makes it makes the priorities greater in terms of trying to stay in tune with that thing, because the uh, material world, one's body starts uh, changing, and and you really want to focus on yourself as a spiritual entity and not just define yourself by your body. But 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 my uh, it was my early twenties that really that really did it, and I just am so grateful for it, and I just uh, don't even know how to share with anybody except by example and if anybody asks a question you know again different paths for different people i honor religions i know people that are jews spiritual jews christians buddhists who get enormous amount out of it every much as i can get out of my my way my particular way though was uh, was through this teacher and through the idea of devotion of seeing the divine in many forms and 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 not not to be uh a member of a of an organization or or religion, although the Hindu tradition is the one that speaks to me most uh, deeply mm-hmm. somehow. Um, one last comment question, Danny. This whole podcast, this whole idea came up actually when uh, somebody gave a call to me and uh, just about doing uh, some uh, getting some talks of Ramdas from those early days, those same talks that the three of us heard to get them out to a new generation of people. And he felt he's actually has a very well-known podcast. Duncan Trussell is his name. And he felt like, he he said, there's a lot of parallels of my generation of 20s and 30s. There's a lot of parallels, a lot of stressors that are very similar to the ones that you went through. There's There's been a major war for many years, more than one. There's a lot of suffering going on, you know, regarding economic conditions and a lot of polarization politically and so on and so forth. Very, very similar stuff. And he, he, you know, said, I think that you guys should offer whatever it is that you experienced back then and um, to uh, – to us at this point, do you do you feel uh, as if this generation that there's that there's a, a similarity from what we went through in the late sixties and early seventies? No, I I have a um, a bias that's almost like an obsession that I can't prove, but I'm I'm always biased in favor of younger generations and believing that they're that they're very valid and finding these things. And everybody finds things in their own way. You know, I, there's no particular reason why the references from 40 years ago would necessarily speak to people, but in certain instances, you know, uh, it might. You know, again, I, I, I think there's all... The, the spirit is, is mysterious in the way it speaks to people. But I think that giving people... You know, my first concern in life was to be cool, not to be spiritual. I wanted to be sexy. I wanted to be cool. I wanted other cool people to respect me. And that was a huge obsession, and I think it is of a lot of a lot of young people. And, you know, I think that it's good to find a context to kind of give permission and a feeling that you can be cool and you can still tune into ancient traditions that are timeless and not, not trendy and still right. be trendy. And that's a gift that Ramdas gave us, because 
he was as cool as you could be, and yet he was as tuned into you know the eternal as you could be. Uh, and and to the extent that that uh, of course I learned a lot from reading about Yogananda's life in the 20s and 30s, and meant a lot to me in Ramakrishna in the 1890s. And so you never know what's going to touch people. I think those of us that have a connection to the light should should find ways of sharing it in a way that's not preachy but that's authentic. And you never mm-hmm. know what's going to inspire somebody. And yeah. And, uh, you know, because we're all vehicles for something that we don't really understand, but to the extent that one can be a vehicle, one should be, because that's, we were the benefit of other people being vehicles, you know, and this is, this is a vehicle, and you just never know where, where the energy goes, but, you know, it's, it's to the extent that you can allow it to come through you, it's, it's, it's a really good thing to do. I believe that's absolutely true, and, uh, I'll just uh, close with one comment. A long time ago, back then, I uh, produced a uh, rock festival in Montreal, where I'm from, and uh, the headliner was Van Morrison, who I absolutely loved, and to this day, and his, I think his music spoke to me, you know, at, at that level, uh, level of, uh, of Dylan and so on, Hendrix, um, and he got uh, kind of messed up, and he was a volatile guy, and he got a little bit messed up because somebody uh, actually walked in his dressing room, picked up his guitar, and started playing it. It was on acid or something, and he flipped out, and he was not going to perform, but I convinced him, you know, come on, let's uh, relax. We'll go have dinner. We'll have some wine. He did that, and he put on the greatest show uh, that I've ever seen Van do. And then I walked him out to his limo and he was going to take off and he just looked at me and he said, you know, he was thankful that I had kind of helped save the situation. And he just said to me, man, just stay solid. That's all there is. And, uh, Danny, we've had, uh, uh, quite a ride over many years. David and I talked about Triloka records in another, in the previous podcast. And, uh, Thanks for being solid. For all well, these years. thank thank you both, and uh, I I can't wait to listen to the other uh, podcasts and uh, be interesting to see where this energy takes us all. It's great to still be alive and smiling. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Yeah. Have a great dinner. Yeah. God bless. And we should uh, before we close, we should, you know, again uh, prompt everybody about our lovely sponsor audible.com and just uh, you can go get that uh, uh, 30-day trial and get a free uh, audiobook and uh, go to mindrollingpodcast.com and you will just follow the prompts there and click through and uh, we, we thank you Dave yeah just keep rock and rolling and mind rolling and uh, stay solid thanks for listening